different characters in the novel. Who's read Don Quixote? Anybody? Yay! Um, through his characters, Cervantes provides insight into what he suffered. Is it on? No. Is this better? Yay! Should we try the happy birthday again? Oh. <laughs> um, so he provided insight into what he suffered and endured. So this wasn't really obvious to me until I did some research, because whenever I get someone to read or say, I like to go see, find out who they are and read about them, the time that they lived in. So when I found out that Cervantes was a veteran, it made a big difference when I was reading the novel. These lived experiences give the story much deeper context than mere imagined pain or suffering. And the novel Don Quixote illustrates the desire to serve, to endure and survive, and to help others do the same. And if there's veterans in the room, I'm sure that resonates with them. So in Don Quixote, uh, military service, um, did I bump my head? No, oh, OK. Um, the knight Eric Quixote was provided advice from his father regarding his vocation. He said, follow one of the paths I shall indicate. Follow letters, another trade, and the third, serve the king in the wars. Of course, Cervantes was writing in a time when there were a lot of religious wars going on under Philip II. And if war does not bring much wealth, it confers great distinction and fame. Now, this is a really long name. Miguel de Cervantes Savadra, did I say it right? His timeline. So he was when he was baptized, we're assuming he was born in the same year. In 1571, he served at the Battle of Lepanto, um, and he was wounded and maimed, and he returned to service after he left the hospital. Um, in 1575, he was captured by Barbary Corsairs. Um, they were pirates. He was held in a prison in Algiers uh, for two years, and, and his brother, as, he helped his brother escape. And then he tried, he was there for five additional years, and he tried, he continually tried to escape. He was finally freed in 1580 when his um, ransom was paid, and he returned to Madrid. So when he returned to Madrid, he was penniless, he was maimed because he lost use of his arm. And he found no way of making ends meet except to re-enlist in the army. So he re-enlisted and served some more. In 1584, he was married. Um, in 1587, he worked for the commissary of the army and the navy, and he provisioned the Invincible Armada. So that's the Amar armada that went to England to crash Elizabeth I. Um, in 1587, he, or 1594, he was a tax gatherer for Granada. Well, he wasn't a very good bookkeeper, so they threw him in jail for three months. Um, and then he uh, remained for several years in Seville, wandered through Spain, which is, is very evident for some of the things he talks about in the novel. He was arrested again at um, Argamasilla, and then he began writing Don Quixote while he was imprisoned. That was published in 1605. So that's just kind of a little timeline of, hey, this is what he was doing. So his service, one of the main, the, so I think the main thing I wanted to focus on was his service on, aboard the Marquesa, the Battle of Lepanto. Um, that's a very famous battle, and that's where he lost the use of his left arm. He received three gunshot wounds, two in the chest, and another that permanently maimed his left hand. He was returned to a hospital in Messina and was paid 82 ducats by the Spanish government. He took part in other military actions at Navarino, Tunis, and Goleta. So he continued his service even after he was wounded. And so some of that was his commitment to God and country and his king. I think I skipped ahead. Oh, I think I went back. There we go. Now, in Don Quixote, Don Quixote also talks about his service. And I just kind of plucked this quote out because it was interesting to me because they were fighting in religious wars. And he, peace, says Don Quixote, is where hast thou ever seen or heard that a knight errant has been arranged, arraigned before a court of justice, however many homicides he may have committed. So it's an interesting um, juxtaposition about where he was in terms of faith and they're fighting wars of faith and yet here they are doing the, the, the holy wars. Um, 
and Cervantes, or Don Quixote in the novel is that knight errant. So he's a man of learning and books, and so he's read lots of stories about, you know, the famous knights, Sir Lancelot, and all those guys that go out doing that thing. So Cervantes, when he was serious, uh, th that captivity with uh, when he was captured by Barbary pirates, um, on the voyage homeward, he and his brother Rodrigo were captured, and they were sold into slavery in Algiers. His brother was released, but he was kept in bondage for five more years. He was very seriously tortured. Um, he repeatedly tried to escape, and that just meant the severity of his treatment increased. So when we're reading Don Quixote, actually that comes out in the novel in several places. But Cervantes relates in Don Quixote in book one through the memories of Quixote while he is a captive of Don Fernando, how I was laboring at the oar without any hope of freedom. So it gives you a sense of the hopelessness and the loss, um, the fear. And he continues by relating, to my mind there is no happiness on earth to compare with recovering lost liberty. So the resilience factor here is Quixote relates his tale of imprisonment and the hope of obtaining his liberty never deserted him. And when in his plots and schemes and attempts, the result did not answer my expectations without giving way to despair, I immediately began to look out for or conjure up some new hope to support me, however faint or feeble it might be. I think that really resonated for me in terms of the resilience that even in the most desperate situation, after he'd already been wounded, after he'd already been served in multiple conflicts, he still went back, he still had hope, he still thought he was gonna return home, and then he returned home to serve some more. That's resilience, isn't it? Cervantes, as a veteran, was freed and returned to Madrid. He was penniless and maimed. He found no way of making ends meet except to re-enlist in the army. Cervantes served Spain again and again because other opportunities were not available to a man with the use of only one arm. Um, that just kind of resonated to me because I see that happen with uh, employers that I have worked with uh, since I left the military. Yes, I'm a veteran. Um, and uh, I think it's important to note that, I think this thing has a mind of its own, um, that sometimes those challenges exist for us. Through Don Quixote, there is reference to personal distinction with military service, and it is part of this chivalric code to which Quixote and Cervantes adhere. For Cervantes, the scars of battle were a testament to his service to God, his king, his country, and by writing Don Quixote, he demonstrates his own resilience and offers it to others. By looking closely at literature and its authors, the insight of military service can be discovered. So examples, I like to point this out to my classmates in my PhD program, um, and anybody that'll listen to me, he sat next to me, that he knows. <laughs> um, Socrates was a veteran, Plato was a veteran, Cicero was a veteran, Samuel Taylor Coleridge was a veteran, Friedrich Nietzsche was a veteran, two times. He, um, Edric, um, Eric Marie Remarque, he wrote um, All Quiet on the Western Front, veteran. Rod Serling, World War II veteran, Kurt Vonnegut, veteran Vietnam era. So I think it's important to note that some of our finest literature, philosophy and fiction, you name it, is born out of veterans. Cervantes on Don Quixote, um, he reflected at the end, for me alone was Don Quixote, Don Quixote born and I for him. It was his act, mine to write, and we two together make but one. So I think that's important that Cervantes is weaving into the story and letting us know that he wrote this for himself and they're actually one and the same. Uh, so Cervantes' character, Don Quixote, has been translated. I think this shows some of the resilience and the accomplishment. Cervantes' character, Don Quixote, has been translated into more languages than any other book except the Bible. Cervantes, uh, Don, Quixote, Don Quixote, is the most living, the most endearing, and the best known character in all literature. If you say something about tilting at wind windmills, everybody knows who you're talking about. Cervantes established the modern novel with the writing of Don Quixote. There was a change, and there must be literature people. We're all nodding. Yes. And according to Durant, Cervantes raised the new form of fiction to philosophy by making it reveal and illuminate the moral gamut of mankind. So I think that's really significant. And then there's my works I just page. So thank you for listening and sharing this time with me.
do I just exit out? Next. If you, need, if you use the mouse, that's really glitch. All right. Oops. All right. Next. Thank you. All right. Now I have to find where these, uh, where these slides went. There we go. All right. How are we doing? All right. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bob Beard. Thank you for inviting me to share this time with these folks and with you. And I'm here to talk a little bit about a project called the Veterans Imagination Project, which is an intervention to improve veterans and uh, you know uh, veterans transition to the civilian world and to support future career readiness. So this is me. I'm a pre 9/11 uh, Marine veteran. I worked as an ammunition technician and a logistics specialist from 1995 to 1999. And if you fast forward just, just a little bit, like 23 years, uh, here I am hanging out with the greatest college mascot in history. Thanks very much, Sparky. And uh, chatting with you all today. And how I got from there to this is really what animates this entire project. Um, you know, it's a far cry from stacking ammo on ships, but now I work at a research center called the Center for Science and the Imagination here at ASU. We're a research and public outreach center. We're part of the College of Global Futures here at Arizona State University, and we work on helping organizations, corporations, schools, and people to think differently about the future. Uh, we've been at this for a almost 10 years, uh, and we've developed a set of methods around futures thinking and collaborative imagination to cultivate these three things, foresight, empathy, and yes, resilience. That's why we're all here. Uh, these are important skills, foresight, empathy, and resilience. They're important skills for the 21st century workforce because, you know, we're, we're all trying to do our business, right? But amid a number of world-altering events and technologies, including climate change, automation, new social movements, whether they're inside the metaverse or outside the metaverse. So really, you know, in all of these ways, the future seems closer than ever. And for many of these organizations, they're using methods like ours and others as a way to inoculate themselves from something called future shock. Is everybody familiar with the term future shock? Right? Sociolo sociologist Alvin Toffler, he coined this in the 60s. He wrote a best-selling book uh, by the same title in the 70s about the pace of innovation and those societal effects, which you can read up here. And so for many of the organizations that I mentioned in the previous slide, that work is of strategic importance. So they can understand how technological discoveries, social, science, uh, social systems, and environmental changes will affect their work in the next 10, 15 to 20 years, right? It's a good way to sort of rehearse for the futures that they want that are optimal for their organization's continued sustainability and continued relevance. But as we're all aware, 200,000 men and women transition out of the military every year. And for them, that radical change that we're talking about is not on the distant horizon. It's present just as soon as they take off their uniform, sign that DD-214, and drive off of the base, right? And the military is this world-class organization, and it does a fantastic job of training people, like myself and many of people here, to do the jobs that we were hired to do, right? If, if that's your ASVAB score, they know exactly how to lock in and train you for that job. So there's a significant investment in time, in resources, and the learning science that goes into military induction. But too often, I believe, the way out of the service is treated more like a simple job change or a relocation. And again, for the veterans in the room, we know that couldn't be further than the truth because rather it's a fundamental personal transition and it affects everything from a person's attitudes to their values to their self-conception and their understanding of their place in broader society. And that sort of psychological transformation, that takes time and space and support to develop some new mental models for adaptation, for resilience, and this creation of a new post-service identity. And so oftentimes, like, those soft skills are overlooked in order to serve the more pressing imperatives, right? Replacing that, uh, you know, that, that standard of living, uh, finding new employment, finding housing, navigating VA benefits, and even in the best case scenario where it's a lateral move, there's still a lot of nuance to navigate in the civilian world. 
And I believe ignoring these soft skills can be detrimental, right? Everyone's journey is a little bit different. For me, I, I, I will tell you that it took me about 10 years to figure out my path. And so I believe that a successful transition from military to civilian life requires imagination and futures thinking. Without the opportunity to imagine different futures for themselves, we have highly trained men and women who are relegated to unfulfilling jobs, unsuited to their experience and abilities. And by failing to imagine a veteran's potential, employers and the public at large do a disservice to those who volunteer to serve our nation. So this program really equips veterans for post-service success by teaching them the same foresight and futuring methods that we use with Google, with Meta Labs, with uh, um, the Smithsonian and the National Science Foundation, and all of these research and creative projects. So in the interest of time, I'll just briefly run through our methodology. This is an eight-week program for a, a small group of, uh, of veterans. Right now, in our pilot program, we have five veterans in our cohort. We can usually support up to 10 in this sort of phase of the work. And so the first week is about understanding the tools of foresight and how these can be applied to their own personal transformation. A lot of folks don't really feel like they even have the permission to imagine the future, right? But still, at the same time, there are many people telling us what the future is going to be like. Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are very involved in getting people on board with their vision of the future. So this first week is really about showing how these methods work and how they can be applied to personal transformation. Also, it's about community building. We get out of the military, we lose that community. So, you know, trust is essential to imagining together. So this is a collaborative process. And in that first, uh, that first session, we're talking about how to come together as a new unit. In the second week, we start to really get into the details of the process. Um, we, you know, look again at these visions of the future that are being presented to us, and we critique these perspectives. We identify what values and what actions people that are telling us what the future is going to be like, what, what they're actually trying to get us to do. Then we do an exercise where participants will reflect on their own values and their own priorities and start to imagine how those will manifest in 5, 10, 20 years. In week three, we really expand the network um, imagining not just what we want, but also developing the skills to turn those dreams into reality. So we work with participants to give them the tools to expand their networks. We put them in touch with domain experts and then help them do the necessary research to identify upcoming trends in their chosen career fields. Uh, this is you know, reading the news, technical reports, the World Economic Forum, as well as talking to those professional leaders to gain different insights. Uh, in week four, we start in building scenarios. We do a process called world building. World building is often associated with, you know, big science fiction pictures, right? Anything that the Marvel Cinematic Universe is doing, they first start with a world build. Um, it's also a very powerful personal tool to set individual goal setting and sort of start to navigate the knowns and the unknowns of the world to realize a personal preferable future. Uh, the next week, we move our participants from actually these scenarios into fully formed stories. And as Nan says, right, veterans are great storytellers. In the military, we told stories all the time. So we're getting them to tell these stories about their own futures that are emotionally exciting and personally fulfilling. In week six, we pair them with concept artists to collaborate with the veterans and turn their research into visions of post-service success that feature them as you know, key figures in that future. This process of communicating and then visualizing their future helps to make something that was previously intangible more real, right? We want them to inhabit these futures. In week seven, we have this fully realized picture of a possible and preferred future, so we engage in a process of reflection and backcasting to identify and define those necessary steps to make this future vision more of a reality. We also use this time to help our participants identify other community resources to reach their goals. We have them for eight weeks, but we don't want them to sort of just go off and be adrift after that, so we're connecting them with other VSOs and other resources that can help them on this new journey. And then finally, in week eight, our participants get this glimpse of their future selves through this piece of concept art that they can share in a student showcase. But we don't want to just share this with family and friends and funders. We also intend to share these stories with vision, uh, these stories and visions uh, broadly with the public through uh, online publications, through in-person events and special exhibitions to facilitate a better public understanding of veterans in the community. Uh, one of our colleagues here at ASU says, if you've met one veteran, 
well, that's it. You've met one veteran. And so we imagine that by sharing these stories and aspirations, we can assist the public in one, reimagining how they see veterans, right? The, the sort of unique person that each veteran is. And two, also understanding the role that they themselves have in contributing to a veteran's transition and their post-service success. So um, I'll just share a few images from our past participants, including uh, this is a, a future in diplomacy, this is a future in environmental engineering, and a future in law enforcement and public policy. Uh, just a word from one of our past participants. I'll just linger on that because it gives me goosebumps. Uh, and then as far as where we are now, we're currently funded through a grant from ASU Women in Philanthropy to run two community sessions around Metro Phoenix and then develop a train the trainer module that can be adopted by community groups, libraries, and other VSOs, people that are serving veterans. This is some, uh, another tool for their toolkit. As far as future goals, uh, and enlisting the support of the assembled uh, uh, scholars. Uh, I'd love to have this program operating in multiple communities throughout Arizona. I'd love to see this picked up in other universities and other sort of academic settings. And then stretch goal, put this in Department of Defense, put this into formal transition services. Part of a, you know, a larger effort where we can serve more folks or you know, a big part of TAP and TRS is you know, setting up a LinkedIn profile. Why don't we work with LinkedIn Learning that, you know, on, on a sort of abbreviated course, you know, someone, something that they can do online sort of earlier in their transition pipeline. We already have interest from uh, ASU, the Stanford D School, and the Institute for the Future. Uh, lastly, just a, uh, just a quick quote by a science fiction luminary, William Gibson, uh, who, you know, wrote about the technologies that we're all experiencing right now with virtual reality. And he says, the future is already here. It's not just evenly distributed yet. And so our program supports veterans in transition through a holistic approach, right? We combine traditional services like career counseling and art therapy, but we infuse them with these future-oriented insights. And we're intentionally focusing on career readiness as an early intervention. It's one of the most sort of pressing needs when you get out of the military. But I think by emphasizing the process and tools of imagination, we can inspire reflection about the whole person. And these are decision-making skills that can be used throughout their lives. Um, I like to think of this project as opening the aperture on the future. So we go from this to this. And we move veterans from their previously defined roles as members of the military and engage them to think about themselves as agents and drivers of a bigger future and a better world. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Joshua Fletcher, major, U.S. Army, retired, Ph.D. student with Sullivan University out of Louisville, Kentucky. Before I begin, I would like to thank everybody on the committee for inviting me here for this amazing opportunity and those that have helped me along my Ph.D. journey. I'll be presenting my pilot study uh, that I conducted earlier this year on what motivates veterans to become small business owners, a grounded theory study. Here's the agenda. So the objectives is to talk about what motivates veterans to become small business owners, to talk about the emerging trends that I found in my study and the key findings that led to the grounded theory of good deed motivation theory of veteran small business owners. So the so what of this research, why is it important? The total population of U.S. veterans in 2018 and today is approximately 18 million, or 7% of the total U.S. population. When you look at the minority of veteran or small business owners, the veterans' small business owners account for a combined total of approximately 14% as sole proprietorships and also employment firms. Any significant changes to the veteran small business owner population have the potential to impact the overall U.S. economy and employee workforce. So as you can see with the percentages there, 
Veterans represent a, a large portion of the U.S. economy for small businesses, um, and that's how they contribute back to the economy and to, so to society after they retire from their service and hang up their uniform. Problem statement came out of the so what, you know, they represent the overwhelming majority of small business owners, but the current statistics and existing literature only account for the behavior of veteran small business owners and does not actually explore what motivates these veterans, failing to recognize the many influences that explain the differences of veteran small business owners. Here's the purpose. So the research was aimed at identifying what motivates veterans to become small business owners, identifying emerging themes and trends, identifying motivational factors, and overall ultimately contributing to the body of existing research. The abstract, the purpose of this grounded theory study was to explore the motivations of veteran small business owners. There's a gap in research literature, even though they make up the largest minority of the entire U.S. business population at 14%, there is still a gap on the existing uh, research literature. And only about a third of small businesses survive more than 10 years. That's an important fact to keep in mind when you talk about resilience and veterans owning small businesses. And we'll get to that with the model at the end of the, the brief here. Literature review topics, don't worry. I'm not gonna go down in any rabbit holes with a literature review here due to time constraints. But the one I would like to point out here is the third one there, failure, success, and risk. Again, we'll talk about this in my model at the end, but this is how it ties into resilience. You know, veterans have to be resilient when you encounter these failures in small business and continue going and overcoming these failures. This is a qualitative grounded theory study. Again, this is a pilot study only three to five interviews uh, were projected to be conducted. I had two at the eight week uh, timeline that I had to complete my assignment. However, the IRB approval was good for one year and I interviewed up to five participants. Now, even though there was only five participants in this pilot study, saturation still occurred. And that we'll talk about in the key findings here in a moment. So this is the meat and potatoes of the study here, the findings. The primary motivation can vary among veteran small business owners, and it is also likely that they have more than, one, more than one motivation to start a small business. But all motivations may be considered equally important. Bullet two here is really the key point that I would like to highlight. So the top three reasons why veterans start a small business making a positive difference in the world and doing something good for society, decision-making autonomy, and then financial freedom, financial success, however you want to word that. And number one was the common primary motivation found in these participant interviews, which led to the grounded theory study, grounded theory that I refer to as the veteran small business owner good deed motivation theory. Here's a chart outlining the identified cat categories from the axial coding and open coding. If you look again here at redefining success and failure in small business, the subcategories, small victories and wins, not quitting, learning, adapting, all those kind of tie into resilience um, when, it, when you talk about veterans and small business owners in general. All right, so there's a lot going on over here, okay? But it is really kind of easy to understand. This is a cyclic model, a continuous cycle model. Um, the veteran enters when he gets the motivation to do something good for society or do something good for the community. He starts a small business, he or she, and they enter this continuous model cycle. And as you see here, it is a continuous cycle of failures and success. And all of this came out of the participant interviews and the data that I got from the interview questions. Um, they adapt to the situation here. Anytime they encounter a failure along their small business venture, and the key, one of the key findings was 
you're going to encounter failures and challenges and roadblocks along your small business venture. And you have to have that resilience to learn to adapt and overcome those failures and keep going. And veterans do have that resilience that they learn from the military. So that could be a future study to kind of dig into that and see if that is one of the reasons uh, that makes them successful small business owners. Um, and then one of the last things I'll highlight here, a lot of the times the failure, not always, but most of the time, the failure comes from an environmental input into that cycle. So when you look at theories, you know, you're looking at the open systems theory that really equates to the small business model here for veterans. Um, and then the output. So they start with a good deed. They want to do something good for society, good for the community. And that is ultimately the output. That intrinsic motivation factor that keeps them going is to put that, do that good deed and get that back out into the external environment. Summary, talked about the primary reasons why veterans become, want to become small business owners. While this question has not been completely answered from the study, it does start the initial conversation about the topic, resulted in a grounded theory known as the good deed motivational theory for small business owners, and hopefully it leads to future exploration of the topic. Questions? We'll pull all those together at the end. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Robert White. Uh, today I'd like to talk to you about what we've all been talking about, which is veterans and transitions. And there's some spots where I'm going to agree with some of my colleagues up here and some spots where I'm going to, I'm going to disagree, to be blunt. Uh, this is based on my research I, that I've done over the past couple years. Uh, I found it very interesting, and I hope you, hope you enjoy it. First, I want to kind of talk about my life and my background to frame where I'm coming from this, in this uh, conversation. So I kind of broke it into the categories of my personal life, my professional life, my academic life. I started my professional life enlisting in the infantry in 95 right out of high school. Through some weird twist of fate, I wound up going to the West Point Prep School and ultimately uh, graduated from West Point in 2001. Across the middle there, you can see I did a couple of deployments to Iraq, uh, both as a second lieutenant finance officer in his command in 2006. In 2007, I left the Army and joined a, a uh, Motiva, which is an oil company. It was a joint venture between Shell and Saudi Aramco. And then a few years ago, about a decade ago, I joined Shell entirely. Along the way, I met my wife uh, right, after, right after I enlisted. We got married and had five kids. Uh, I've got my undergraduate degrees in chemistry and nuclear engineering. I've got graduate degrees in finance, project management, and of course, my PhD in leadership. And on the bottom, I, I like to show this too, is all the places I've lived, all the states I've lived along the way. So I, I frame this because uh, we're talking about veterans in transition, and veterans, I feel like we're always in transition, whether we're in the military, moving every two to four years, uh, getting different degrees, leaving the military, and even once we leave the military, transitioning from job to job afterward. But, but this is the important part of my personal journey. So when I left the Army to work for Shell in about 2008, the same year, 14 others made this same transition, junior military officers, went through the same program, left the military, joined Shell. Around the 18 to 24 month mark, there were only two of us left. Two of us. At Shell, it's a great company, pays fantastic, easy work. Why was everybody leaving? Uh, I noticed in my, a lot of my friends that had left the military at the same time, the same thing. Two, to, two, to, uh, two year mark, 18 to 24 month mark, just leaving, just unhappy. I formed a veterans mentoring circle inside of Shell to reach out and try and understand anecdotally why, because this bothered me. I had legitimate complaints. Uh, nobody, nobody said anything weird, but it all felt like symptoms of something I couldn't diagnose. And then recently, as I started my journey into learning my PhD, I thought about my own leadership journey. And the academic, the academic study of leadership basically goes the same way. It essentially starts after World War II, World War I, we started talking about great man theory, right? Who, who, is, who is a good leader, right? What, what, is, what, is, what makes a great leader? 
And then the academic research starts to transition to, well, how do you be a great leader, right? And that's where you get these, these transformational, transactional theories of leadership. But what really started to resonate me, which is a much more recent, relatively recent in academic theory, is the why of leadership. Why do leaders do what they do? The U.S. Chamber of Commerce uh, commissioned some research back in 2016, and they came up with some anecdotal reasons of why veterans were, were transitioning jobs. Those first four right there, that's anybody, right? Anybody can say, I don't like where I live, uh, bad leadership, I don't like where I'm paid, I have no way to get, I have no career, clear career path, that's fine. But those three on the bottom, I felt as I was looking through the research that those were unique to veterans. No camaraderie, lack of respect for veterans' leadership experience, and that lost sense of purpose. And that one, that one really stuck out to me is, is what does this mean? And then the other point, of course, in this same study, it, this isn't just about the veterans, it's about the business, it's about the investment too. Uh, turnover is expensive. One and a half times uh, the cost of, of an annual salary for employee turnover. That's, this is the value case, not just to the veteran, but to the businesses of why this research matters. So the real theory that resonates with me, the theory that I, ho I hope to hold myself accountable to, and the theory that I think most military service members hold themselves to is the concept of servant leadership. Servant leadership as an academic theory was introduced by Robert Greenleaf in the 70s in his, uh, in his uh, essay. A servant as a leader. Uh, but to me, the greatest servant leader, of course, and we can disagree on religions, that's fine, but I think one thing most religions can say is that Jesus was a great leader, uh, and he, was, he, pro he preached servant leadership consistently throughout his, his journeys. The, the servant leadership construct I used for mine was created by Van Deeren, Duncan Knighton in 2011, which is a servant leadership survey, and an important part here is it had the, const the constructs of empowerment, standing back, authenticity, interpersonal acceptance, humility, courage, and stewardship. Which I think are kind of like, those, those, are the, those are the constructs they said we think of when we think of servant leadership. And I think those kind of all resonate with us when we think of a servant leader. I wanted to compare that against job satisfaction because the research is clear that job satisfaction is an indicator of turnover. It's, if, I, if I tried to isolate my surveys down to people that are about to quit, I could have probably only had about 10 participants and even those probably wouldn't have participated. So I needed to think broader. Uh, my broad way of thinking was to talk about uh, job satisfaction using the Minnesota Satisfaction Questionnaire. And you can see they basically break it into three buckets, intrinsic, extrinsic, and overall. A lot of these specific instruments related very well to what I was trying to look at for servant leadership. Research methodology is pretty clear. Thorough leadership review. Uh, I sampled some veterans. I used multiple regression tests, and I, and I required the uh, level significance of uh, less than 0.05. You can see that, that was my graduation picture there with my, chair, my committee chair, Dr. Robert Green. Also a veteran, a major in the infantry. Just some of, the, some of my sample highlights, you can see in the, uh, the map on the top left there, uh, I got participants from all over the country, which is good. Only one international participant in Canada, I don't know if you call it international or not, it could have just been an IP error. Um, you can see that in general, the, the median age was around the 38, the late 30s, uh, overwhelmingly male with, with about 25 females. Uh, and in the tenure, most people were, were pretty junior in their, in their post-military career, in that, that kind of five to 10 range uh, area. Job level was a construct I did to basically figure out how senior in the organization they would be. So the further to the right, that would be like the CEO of the organization. The further to the left would be like the, the people on the front line. So you can see a lot of mid-level leaders, low to mid-level leaders in this survey. And then their final ranks when they left, uh, overwhelmingly junior officers. Okay, here's the good stuff. Here's where it matters. Here's the findings. Great graphs, I'll break them down. Basically, what I found over and over and over and over and over again for my control variables, the only control variable that mattered, all those control variables I just showed you, the only control variable that mattered with job satisfaction was tenure. Nothing else mattered, right? But even more importantly, what really mattered for servant leadership, of all those, all those constructs under servant leadership, the only one that consistently came up in intrinsic, extrinsic, and overall job satisfaction was empowerment which surprised me, but I, can, I, I, I unpacked it a little bit, and I think I understand why. Stewardship showed up a little bit, but not significantly. Here's the implications, empowerment matters. I think the, the first, first four parts, uh, the first five parts of uh, the definition of empowerment, information to do work, encourage new ideas, uh, enable veterans to solve problems, encourage use of talents. Hey, I think we just need managers to acknowledge the caliber of leadership of veterans. So the, on the bottom, that yellow part, the two highlights. Managers should focus on the intent and let the people try new things. And more importantly, it's something I learned early, 
Veterans should realize they're more empowered than they are. In the Army, it's very clear. This is your job, this is your command, this is what you can do, this is what you can't do. At Shell, it was like, here's your office, figure it out. And I always found I could do more than I thought I could. And for the bottom two, I think that there's this concept of growth. In the military, we were constantly rewarded with trinkets. We knew what it meant to be promoted. We knew what it meant to go to like ranger school or airborne school or that. We knew what those looked like and you could look around and be like, okay, I'm a captain, here's a major, I know what to do to get into his shoes, right? Uh, that's not as clear in the, in the civilian world. So on the one hand, the manager should really look into that mentoring relationship. Let me find you a mentor that can help you navigate to understand what's the difference between a director and a vice president, because frankly, I still haven't figured that out myself. Uh, and, and finally, veterans need to understand that when we leave, we have to own our career too, right? There's no, there's no HR group that's going to own our career. We have to own it. Here's the numbers, and I'll leave you with this. 40% of the variance of intrinsic job satisfaction, empowerment. 42%, 43% almost of extrinsic job satisfaction, empowerment. 52% of overall job satisfaction is if a veteran feels empowered. For veterans, empowerment matters. Thank you. Well, for starters, you've certainly left a lot to chew over. Um, because we have a, a limited amount of time, it seems to be one thread that was running through all of these presentations had to do with the capacity of the right way to think about the what-ifs. Either or perhaps both on, on a personal level and some kind of communal level, whether that's an entire speculative world or a small business or a big business or something in between. So, Talk among yourselves along those lines, if you're so inclined, before we open it up to... So when we're talking about a because I have, I have a little squeaky voice. Um, so when we're talking about a speculative world, I'm looking at it from fiction, um, and so when you're world building in fiction. And so I could see some trends where Cervantes went to work, you know, he, he was jailed, he didn't manage the finances very good for what he was doing. Okay, so I can see some opportunities there where when he became his own employer and he was empowered to write novels, he also wrote plays, some poetry and other things, but um, uh, he was empowered through his writing to be his own person, share his own experience with others. And, it, and it's not about complaining, so he didn't complain that he had these, this, he, found a way to make it work. And I think that in, when we write a story, when you write a piece of fiction, the, the literature professors up there can help me out maybe, but it's, you're, you're building a world. So you're anticipating, how am I gonna take this character and move him through this experience? Does any of the rest of you wanna? And I think that talks about um, how we're looking at starting a business or building a world, how we're um, working our way through some of these amazing numbers and also in then transitioning from the service into another. Yeah, I think, I, I like what you said there. I think I'd, I'd pivot slightly. What, what I like is, is the, in the what ifs world and in the Cervantes world and in the small business world, you know, your model really stood out as, as failures, right? And my model, my experience is veterans leaving, veterans turnover, right? Uh, and I, I don't know what experience you've got with that, Bob. I'm happy to hear. I know you said you, you had a, a, a twisted route to your 10 years to get there, right? Sure, yeah. Um, so, so I think what's, what's interesting in all of these, well, along with the what-if threat, is that, that consistent threat of failure. Uh, and I, you could easily look at that, you could easily look at mine and say, or any of these, and say, well, that's an example of how veterans are not resilient, right? They, they quit, right? But the veterans that are quitting are not quitting and just qu giving up. They're quitting and going for other jobs. Or they're quitting and, as you say, opening their own business, right? Uh, or they're quitting and hopefully they're imagining their future, right? So, so I, I, do wanna, I do wanna make sure that we're not creating a negative mindset of this, this failure for veterans or anything like that to say that veterans aren't resilient. I think it's the exact opposite. Uh, and I think the Cervantes story shows that too. Getting thrown in jail, being a bad accountant, you know, lo losing, losing an arm, still being resilient, right? So maybe, maybe Bob, if you, if you could uh, 
talk, talk about how that intersects with, with your stuff. Yeah, I think, I, I think the, the idea of resilience, and it's also tied into sort of like theories of self-efficacy, believing that you can, right? Uh, and I think, you know, so much of, you know, sort of that early transition period is still operating off of the, uh, again, sort of the known knowns, right? Like you have a platoon sergeant telling you to go to dental, right? Like you have all of these, um, you know, sort of backstops in place. And as you say, right, as, as soon as that ends, no one is, no one is shepherding your career. And I think that there's, there's a dissonance between sort of the, the culture that we're brought up in, right, that we're indoctrinated in, you know, at, you know, 19 years old, right, that it actually sort of neurologically becomes a part of it, right? The, the example that I've, I've heard that I will, uh, that, that, that I will forward on from a psychiatrist at the, uh, at the VA is that, you know, at the very beginning of your service, right, your brain's, you know, if you go in, you know, 19 years old, just out of high school, your brain's not still developed yet. And so these values and this, you know, sort of community that you are, that you're thrust into becomes sort of neurologically a part of your, a part of your mind. It's a, you know, sort of like a grain of sand that sort of gets calcified and there's, there's a pearl in there. So it's always in there, right? And finding that, you know, finding your voice through storytelling and finding your community and, you know, finding new ways to practice your resilience is key, right? And so if that's, you know, if you're oriented to, you know, starting a small business, you know, fantastic. If you are, you know, building your own world and, and, and sort of, you know, taking your career into your own hands, it, it requires some prototyping. And I think stories, especially stories of professional achievement, are really cheap prototypes, right? You don't have to spend a lot of money. You don't have to, you know, throw yourself into, you know, something full force. You can take those moments and start to use the narrative process to prototype what this future might be for you, and then decide if that's something that you that you truly want to do. That's at least the model that we're working off of. And if I recall correctly, that's the, the, you're setting the stories still in a communal context. It's not the solitary person pondering. It's the interchange about the story. The yeah, it's, it's, story. Really, it's really the act of collaborative imagination, right? We could put folks in a room and say, just imagine what things are going to be like. But there's a, there's a discipline to this work, right? And a lot of it is, is reading and learning from other people and finding sort of the way that your weird grab bag of skills and experiences fits into that world, right? We can, we can write a completely fanciful world where we're all wizards with laser swords, but is that a plausible future? Probably not, right? So we have to figure out how we fit into this, into this new world. So, um, one of the other things that I kind of noted, something you said there resonated, and, and the two gentlemen over there, I, I think I'd like to hear your thoughts on this from your research. But camaraderie is one of the things veterans miss um, when they leave the service and because there's friendships, but then there's camaraderie and there's just something about serving with your mates There's just something there um, And uh, so the camaraderie and then the, the mentorship that comes with that Because I think that's really important in the sense of growth and failure because I wondered if Cervantes had a mentor But I noticed in the story of Don Quixote. He has the the knight errant um, uh, Quixote has, you know, uh, yeah, Sancho, thanks, I just went blank, <laughs> that, that goes with him. And he's sort of the philosophical, you know, common sense thing. So I'm wondering in the research for all of you, if, if you could speak to maybe, I think I just took over the role of... Well, <laughs> I just want to comment, go back um, one step to talk about failure. One of my participants in the study, I think, framed it the best uh, for me, and he said... He doesn't consider any of the failures that he's encountered in a small business an actual failure. He just considers them learning opportunities to grow and adapt. He considers he doesn't consider it a failure unless he quits. You know, unless he quits the small business, then he, you know, that's a failure. So I think that's one of the things like the negative connotation that you were talking about. It's not, we're not talking about negative uh, connotations when we talk about failure. When, when you look at veterans, veterans look at them as, you know, learning opportunities like, okay, one of the things we do in the Army is called AARs, after action reviews. You know, you do a mission, it doesn't go as to according to plan, then you come back, 
and you look at what happened, what was supposed to happen, what went wrong, and how do we fix it and do better next time. So, you know, I think that's one of the things that could be a whole nother research uh, project, you know, redefining failure through the eyes of a veteran. So, so maybe, that's fantastic. I, let me just maybe address your question real fast. So, unfortunately, I cannot answer you quantitatively. I just can't. I don't, I, nothing ever showed up. It never showed up in the surveys. What I can answer you is anecdotally, right? So clearly the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, when they did their survey, yes, they found a loss of camaraderie is bad. Uh, and back to your point, when I was serving as a, as a mentor for veterans, they mentioned that over and over and over again. All my buddies mentioned that, you know, I miss, I miss just hanging out with the other LTs, right? I just miss that part, right? I mean, and, and, and yes, I think it, it's a missing part. I don't know how that can be fulfilled in the corporate world personally. I, I, my personal experience in the corporate world is I look for those experiences somewhere else. Right? I come to places like this where I can hang out with other veterans and we can talk about this stuff, right? I, I'm, I'm never going to find it at Shell, I just don't think, uh, because it, there, there is a lot of, a lot of uh, it, money's involved, let's put it that way. Yeah. Does anyone want to open the conversation? Dr. Hodges. You nailed it. I mean, I don't know what to say. I mean, that, that's, that's a big part of it. That's, that is definitely why I showed my journey, right, is because I'll just be blunt. I am not going to find my sense of purpose in corporate America, right? I love what I do. I'm not complaining. But my sense of purpose is in my family. It's in my personal growth. And it's my ability to, to be a servant leader uh, through others. And I think that the best I can do, and the reason I'm here at all, is to help, help other veterans that have been through this same transition to say, how do I find my own purpose? My purpose is no longer putting on my uniform and going and closing with and destroying the enemy, right? What is my purpose now? I found my purpose. My purpose is serving leadership, right? That's what I do. Um, and all I can do, I hope, is to help others find it too. And I, ho I hope, if, if you guys are taking your time out of your day to be here, that's what you guys are doing too, is helping to find your own purpose in life and hopefully helping some of our brothers and sisters find their purpose too. Yeah, I'll jump in here on mine. The, uh, one of the common factors among all the participants were they all left high paying jobs. You know, they left good paying jobs to go start a small business, which they knew going into it that they could fail financially and, you know, give up, you know, a six figure job to go start their small business. But the reason, the ultimate reason behind that was you can tie that back to the sense of purpose. They wanted to have that purpose of doing something good for the society because you have that as a veteran. When you wear your uniform, you know, and you, you're walking around, you have that sense of pride and purpose that you're doing something, you know, you're willing to lay down your life for the country. That, that is the ultimate sense of purpose, in my opinion. And, you know, when you get out, you're not wearing the uniform anymore. And if you're just working, even though you're making a lot of money, that doesn't fulfill you as a veteran, I think. I think also there's a, do I need this? I'm, I'm loud. I don't have a slight <laughs> voice. Uh, no, I think, I, I think a lot of it, and you know, sort of, you know, if we thread this with an idea of, of storytelling, right? Like your uniform is your story, especially sort of in the Army, right? Your ribbons and badges, it shows the story of your career. Right? And, and you know, the stories that we tell ourselves about post-service success, there's not a lot, right? The, 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 the water table of the culture is, I think, oriented around sort of like post-visions of, of 
most service success, right? Like of, of World War II, right? Uh, you get out, you put all your stuff in a box like my grandfather did, right? You lock that away, you go work at a job for 20 years, you get a gold watch, right? In this, in the world that we live in, right? In this economy, right? Um, that doesn't exist, right? So we, I think the idea of purpose is also linked to like your story. And, and when you're not wearing it, you know, on your sleeve and on your chest, it's, and, and, and those stories, you know, that we've grown up with don't serve us anymore, then it's on us to figure out what those stories are. And so by telling our own stories, right, we, we have the ability to educate the public and, you know, put more stories out into the world that, you know, people can react against and, uh, and, and build upon. Very good point. And I think what you said about Cervantes, because it sounds, I, I don't know, I hope I didn't paint him as a failure, <laughs> but um, I think that one of the, because actually when you consider that he's right up there with the Bible in terms of the, the most printed and most read book, um, he, wanted his, he wanted to be a playwright. And so he wasn't doing so good at writing plays. So it's interesting that while he's in prison, because he did something wrong in another job, he's writing a a, no, a novel that's going to set the standard for others. And I, so I think that's where he found his purpose and his success. I, I, I wasn't thinking as much as Cervantes being a failure, but I mean, at least my understanding of Don Quixote is it's supposed to be sort of a parody, right, of this notion of the knight who goes out and does these chivalrous deeds and carries out his mission. I'm just wondering if that's the way that Cervantes is sort of taking hold that. I think he was. I think he was kind of poking uh, because they were both readers of books. He brought that up several times in in the story of Don Quixote. He was a reader of books, so I think he was poking it at the myths of what a military person and what their life is. So I and and how you how you come away from that and how you succeed. So that kind of my opinion. Thank you. Uh, excellent presentations. Um, I have a kind of a meta question. Uh, and it may turn things in a different direction, but what are the common denominators in the research that are being directed to human resource organizations in the country to educate them about all of the fantastic points that you made about veterans and their capabilities and their resilience. Now, I work for the federal government, so Office of Personnel Management educates us about hiring veterans, so I'm, I'm fully briefed on that, respectfully, uh, humbly. But I'm thinking of organizations like the Society for Human Resource Management, SHRM, which is a major non -pro uh, association based out of Washington, where I am. Um, but I'm just, and this is a naive question, to what extent is the research are there common denominators in the research that can be consolidated and pointed at human resource organizations to educate private companies about the fantastic points that you made, the challenges in overcoming them for the benefit of veterans and acclimating them and making them feel a part of the culture as opposed to perhaps apart from it? So pardon the, the naivete of the question, but I'm just curious. I don't, have a, I don't have a vantage point onto this. I'm just curious. Those who are in research could address that. That's, that's a personal question for me, so I'm gonna jump in before you guys start with all your stats. My pet peeve, okay, so this is where I really get fired up. My pet peeve is, you know, the little disclaimer at the bottom when you, is, is dis, disabled, and then the next word is veterans. That really, really bugs me because veterans are not broken. We're not all disabled, so there you go. Can we find a different way to order the words? Not that, not that both categories aren't important, but it it's just creates a perception. Yeah, I, so I recently retired last year after 20 years of active duty service in the Army. And I can tell you that I apply, I'm talking about my experience to try to you know, answer your question there, sir. Um, I applied for over 73 jobs in three months. I had seven interviews out of those 73 applications. So roughly, you know, you do the math, that's one out of every 10 applications, I was getting called back for an interview. These weren't CEO type jobs, even though I had a master's in management, I was trying to get my foot in the door at a lower tier, entry level type job, you know, uh, non-manual labor. And what I found to be through the human resources personnel that contacted me through these interviews was, 
know, the thank you for your service had one. But we're going to go with somebody else that has three years of experience in this particular field, right? Okay. That just kind of hurt me, you know, as a veteran. Okay. You said leadership was one of the qualities that you wanted for this position. Okay. Look at my resume. I was a company commander of almost 300 soldiers. I think that qualifies to be a leader of your five personnel team here. Right? And, but it, it, I felt that it was more of a, from the human resources perspective, it was more of a tagline, okay, we have to interview a veteran to check the box that, you know, we gave this guy opportunity, we're giving veterans opportunities. All right? I think there needs to be a whole new field directed, when you talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, which is the new hottest thing on the market for HR people, um, for Scherner, et cetera, I think there needs to be a whole new field dedicated to veteran diversity, equity, inclusion, VDEI. I just trademarked that. So there is, a, there is, protected veterans is a protected employment class, right? right? So that does exist, right? But let me answer your question directly. I have no idea. I have no idea. I, I'm, I've been a hiring manager shell for years. I've never once heard anything about any, any kind of uh, you know, understanding of, of veterans needs or anything like that. And when I did my research, I wanted number one to get in whatever funnel you're talking about. All, it, was totally, it was totally for that. That's all I wanted. It's like, how, how, who do I give this to so they can go and tell people? I don't know. This is the first place I found that I could, as a platform to, uh, to explain my research. So my direct answer to you, I don't know. And if you've got a better answer, I'd love to hear it. I think um, there's a, there's a, there's a, um, a paper out of Duke and it says something to the effect of, you know, in a survey of employers hiring veterans, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to try to get this right, but I don't have it in front of me, that employers were, were keen to hire veterans because they saw them as highly capable and competent, but they also saw them sort of lacking empathy. And so it was, okay, well, let's put them working with things rather than people. And I think what narrative development does, and this was a, this was a study funded by um, Google, the, this other study, uh, you know, Google found that uh, narrative development is key you know, for empathy in all fields. And so you know, if we're talking about equity uh, and inclusion, right, empathy for any sort of workplace is, is going to be valued, especially in, you know, in the 21st century workplace, right? Where there are, again, you know, all, these, all of these rapid changes. And so the ability to, to navigate change and to, to see change and to understand it, um, you know, a, a colleague of mine says, you know, change is a constant and, you know, the winds of change are always blowing, but, you know, empathy allows us to, you know, move our sails into those winds, right? So I think, I think narrative development, storytelling, empathy, I mean, that's how I'm trained too. So of course, you know, that's, that's my bias. So. Thank you. Yeah. So can I add one thing to that? Maybe then when there, there could be more HR people that are actually veterans, that might help. Sure. Yeah. I just have a real quick question um, for, for Bob. Um, your program is, is really interesting. How do you measure impact? So what, is, what does success look like for the veteran after, yeah. after the eight weeks? And second question is, do you see a difference based on their time out of service? Yeah, uh, both really good questions. Um, the, the first one, um, this is all very new, right? I ran a pilot class uh, this past semester, and now I'm in the third week of this uh, first cohort in the community. And so one of the questions I have is like sequencing, right? When, when are our folks, you know, uh, you know, sort of more receptive to these messages? And I think it comes to sort of like failure. I think, you know, a, a couple of our participants have tried a few things and they haven't worked out. So, okay, let's let's try this sort of new method. Um, so um, that's that's something that I'm still very interested in is, is as far as the sequencing. Um, and then how we're measuring effectiveness. We're using a, we're using a rather new scale. Uh, it's from, uh, it's a multi-author uh, study. Uh, it's called the Futures Consciousness Scale. And it, it gets to the effectiveness of interventions like this that are focused on futures. And so we're not necessarily following these participants in their career as a longitudinal study. We're looking to see the effectiveness of this, uh, 
you know, of this intervention according to that scale. There's also another, um, there's also another measure called a future self-continuity scale that uh, I have not put into practice, but the more that I sort of, you know, read on that and sort of narrative identity is that's sort of the, that's the follow-on, that's the, that's the second measure. We tried with a, with a career readiness index, but I think that's, it's more attuned to transition and career rather than sort of imaginative capacity. And so, uh, futures consciousness scale and future self-continuity scales. Okay, I think we have two questions up, and then we'll see if there's anything left after that. Um, this one was more for Dr. White, um, but also probably kind of applies to everyone. You kind of brought up faith a little bit, and in sort of leadership. In all of your research, did you find correlations, and were you asking that question with some of the people you were talking with, of those that had a strong faith, answer only in my literature review. Uh, none of my instruments tested resilience against uh, personal faith, but in the literature review, I, mean, I, I think because you're asking the question, you probably know the answer. Uh, yes, in literature review, uh, faith does tend to increase, does positively correlate with, court, with, uh, with resilience. And it correlates with certain leadership, obviously, too, because that's one of the facets. Uh, but, but I can't answer quant quantitatively from my research, unfortunately. A, a follow-on to that really quickly is, uh, do you see, uh, Joshua, the, the good deed motivation, is that more prevalent in, in the veteran community as opposed to sort of the general general public? That would be a great research project. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't compare that with any um, civilian motivation sure. for you know, becoming a small business Some of the civilian motivations in the literature review uh, lean more toward you know, financial success, um, autonomy, you know, decision making. Um, there really wasn't. There, there was a chart that showed the behavior model of entrepreneurs, and you know, a lot of the traits correlated with veterans, like um, good at managing risk, um, you know, good leaders, mm -hmm. leadership qualities, things like that. But I didn't find anything specific like you're asking. But that would be a good comparative analysis. Yes. Yeah. Getting back to sort of purpose and, right. and uh, yeah, and it's being part of something like larger. You could spend an entire life researching all this stuff exactly. and feeding yeah. it to employers exactly. to help them, uh, help them do better, right? Yeah. So. I just would like to answer that a little bit because one of my points was that some of our greatest philosophers were um, veterans. Mm -hmm. And so the good and the true is something that inspires veterans, I think, and speaks to them. Uh, um, and I'm Mike Baumgarten, I'm a graduate student at ASU um, in evolutionary anthropology. So this is going to be more of a statement, um, maybe a challenge. Um, starting with, with the word veteran, um, I think something that is really lacking in largely any, any field that approaches studying this population uh, is a lack of granularity. And we say veteran as if that describes the amount of kind of uh, diversity of experience and background within this population. So I guess there's a question is how do we, if this body represents a group that is interested in studying this, how do we take that apart, right? And there are large data sets, there are papers, they're pretty rare because this is a very understudied um, issue um, that take these things apart, um, for example, by branch, right? Um, there's a great paper that looks at veteran suicide um, beyond that word, right? But it breaks it down by, by branch. And you see there's these huge differences, right? So how do we explain that? But how do we include that in conversations, you know, with, with some of these, these data sets or when we, as a group, use the word veteran? I know it's hard, right? We lack a, a other words. We lack the language to describe that to take it apart publicly. But I think that's, that's, a, major, that's a major issue because to homogenize these experiences, I think, largely oversimplifies and, and reduces them. So it, I turn that over to, to you all. Yeah, I mean, I can't answer that specifically. I, I know exactly what you're talking about, you know, being able to identify veterans. I, I don't know if Dr. Travis Martin is here yet. Do you know if he's here? Okay, you, okay, well, Dr. Travis Martin from Eastern Kentucky University, he actually did, uh, you know, a great study. He's got a book out uh, about veteran identity. 
in the post 9 11 generation? You know, what does it mean to be a veteran? How it's classified in unions and you know, books, etc. Uh, I know that's a great group to tap into. Um, that's not the only thing I can say. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll geek out for a minute and be blunt. The quantitative tools we have limit the kind of analysis you're talking about. So I've got peers that have tried to do, say, servant leadership compared against the other branches. And I'll definitely say I know that the Army is the best branch before I even read the research. <laughs> <laughs> but regardless, we could not get there with the quantitative tools, right? Um, so, so I hear what you're saying. The, we, once you start, the thing is to, to get enough data sets to make a quantitative statement about the, the need for a Marine to feel empowered over the need for an Airman to feel empowered. We just we don't have enough data for that to make a quantitative t-test. Just a simple t-test of those two. There's not enough consistent data to say that we can draw any conclusions out of that. So what we have is we've got a lot of my peers that have done something similar, and they'll do they'll do the uh, they'll they'll make branch a control variable, and they get no differences among the branches. Right? Uh, I think I try, I made a run at trying to make the comparison against the ranks, and I didn't get there either. Hmm. Right, so so I, I hear what you're saying. I don't disagree, and I, I can definitely look around and see veterans that look very different. Um, but the quantitative tools haven't proven that in a, in a reasonable way yet. And I hope they do. I hope you figure it out. Um, but but uh, I, I haven't seen it personally. You have a last quick last word? Yeah, quick question. I think um, I want to jump in because I study Henry Bergson's theory of memory and um, as it kind of tied into stuff that Cervantes was talking about. Um, and I think that's when you say the age, um, the age point when people go in, that's really important. And you leave home and you transition, but you have this sense of home and it's like frozen in your memory. This is the way it was. And you come home. I know when I came home, it was really different. Friends had moved on, things had changed, people had gotten married, and then here I come back. And, and I had a whole different history and set of memories. So part of that transitioning when you come back is right from the get-go understanding that things aren't going to be the same, that it, it is going to be different. And it's, it's the workplace and everything else because you had a job. The Army told, told you what you were going to do, you know, and that's what you did. So to come back... And also, when you come back, the first thing you want to do is forget about anything that has to do with the military. I don't know. That's, <laughs> that's what I wanted. Uh, I'm going to take a page from Robert's book and be blunt. Uh, intentionality. Intentionality on the way out, right? I, I, I use this. I use my example. It took me 13 weeks to just become a basically trained Marine, and then it took me eight months more of, you know, uh, you know, uh, MOS school. And then there was constant on the job training, right? So if you can imagine, I spent almost a year becoming the Marine that the Corps wanted me to be. And when it, time, it came time to get out, again, 1999, right? Things have improved a little bit. I had two and a half days. That's like less time than a long weekend for me to learn how to be a person in the civilian world. Like that's just not enough time, right? So. You know, what, what do we need? we need? We need as much intentionality and learning science on the way in as on the way out. And unfortunately, that just doesn't exist. I previously worked at, uh, at PBS and I produced some, uh, some shows about veterans transition and veterans coming home. And I had a conversation with the Lieutenant Colonel who was you know, uh, from the Pentagon visiting and he's like, I'm really glad that you're doing this because it's not the DOD's job to get you a job and make sure that you're okay when you get out of the military. It's our job to fight and win wars. And I take his point, but it's really easy to sort of write that off and be like, somebody else will catch, right? We have to make sure that somebody else is gonna catch. And if we're not making sure of that, then we need to 
put more intentionality on the way out. Who brought this soapbox in here? I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> pass yeah, it on. I'm gonna kind of piggyback off that. Yeah. Uh, there, based off of my experience of transitioning, you know, recently, nobody in your chain of command that's still wearing the uniform can help you with transition. Yeah. Okay, it doesn't matter how good of a leader they are, they haven't been through that process yet, right? They don't know all the ins and outs. All they know is, you know, rumors or what they've heard maybe, but they have not been through that process themselves, regardless if they're a star major or a colonel, okay? So you're just kind of left out there on an island doing your SSL tap for all the Army folks that's in here, um, which is a soldier for life training program. Again, you know, you can do that up to two years out before you transition, right? But again, it's on your own pace, right? Um, nobody is forcing you to do anything. still either doing stuff in your unit with your current job, you know, you still have duties and responsibilities. I know my buddies that have worked up in Stiffle, the day they signed out on terminal leave, still doing stuff at the unit, okay, not getting a lot of time to transition. Um, I'm going to throw out another trademark idea, okay. Um, the Army has warrior transition units for injured soldiers before they get out, to help them get out. I think the Army needs to develop Army transition units. So when a soldier gets ready to ETS six months out, hey, you're going to an Army transition unit. And you're going to have a first sergeant commander there that their sole job is to help you with transition. And that is all you're going to do for the next six months of your life. You have no responsibilities at the unit, and you're going to have all this time. And that, you know, that, so that's a trademark from transition. Well, and keeping in mind, and, and hanging on what you said, and that the gentleman up there that asked about the variants, keeping in mind that not everybody serves in a war zone, too, and there's so many different kinds of jobs in the military. So transition's going to be really different based on what you did. Oh, yeah. A long walk to the podium. Let's hear it for our panelists, folks. Thank you all so much. So this is going to be the first break of the afternoon. And just to kind of set a little bit of ground rules, get everybody some expectations set for the rest of the, how the couple of days are going to play out. In between these panels, we're going to be taking a 15-minute break, okay? So if you'd like to enjoy some beverages, get one of these sweet ASU cookies, uh, make sure that you do a little bit of stretching, write down any questions you like. you got about 15 minutes to get that done in between the panels. Uh, the individual panels, we've got two more left, will be about an hour and 15 minutes total. That'll include time for Q&A. These have been great questions so far, y'all. Please continue this engagement and collaboration. With that, we're on a quick 15. We'll see you back here. Thanks so much.